So uh, this is my first open source bridge. So I've been trying to like gauge a little bit from different sessions. Like, uh, what's what's the blend between you know like kernel hacker folks, hardware folks, designer, and it seems definitely more geared toward like. Did we, did we start it yet? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Toward toward like the kind of the 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 kernel hacker hardware type stuff versus like des designers. Not many journalists. How many folks in the room are like date journalists day to day? It, right. Uh, what what are they, what do you guys do? Software. Software? Yeah. Like, like, okay. You know what I do. I know what you. Well, you do a little bit. You do a little bit of everything. Yeah. So okay. So I'm. I guess I'm a little bit of a bit of an advocate, and I wanted to talk about like what is data journalism specifically. And there's a lot of overlaps that a lot of people don't know with open source communities and tools that are both you know, consumed by data journalists and also given back from data journalists and uh, a lot of shared or, uh, ideals and how we can work together to solve some uh, civic issues. So first off, just to define journalism, because it gets kind of get thrown around all the time, and, and like say with the New York Times friends I have who are there always are like bemoaning how it's always squished together that if, well, if somebody's an opinion columnist or if they're a journalist, they all kind of get lumped together. And so when, when an opinion columnist writes something, you know, the New York Times gets all this flack. And it's like, well, it's not really the New York Times editorial, it's this one person's opinion. So journalism, at, at like in the core sense, has three functions, which are to report, gather data, to edit it, process it in some way, and to distribute it. So report editing and distributing. And there's this been in kind of the 20th century this ideal of objectivity, but that's not always been a, a tenant of journalism. That okay, we well, got to be neutral, we got to cover both sides. In the uh, early 1900s specifically, it was very subjective, very advocacy driven. Um, but there's regardless of whether we're saying something's objective or subjective, there is still this shared kind of call public uh, higher calling that we're trying to shed light on injustice we're not you know we want to find where the crooks are and expose them and let the, the other systems that are in play deal with the crooks but we at least want to expose the shady activity and there's a lot of parallels i think with with open source um, trying to do transparency in how the information is gathered who are the sources where did you find them? Why did you select these people? Or at least it's supposed to be. And this collective action, showing you information and letting people make a choice with it. This is going to help inform how I'm going to vote, how I'm going to raise my children, how I'm going to interact in my neighborhoods. And a lot of shared challenges, especially from the last, you know, this really flared up in the last two weeks about privacy and security. And not just, you know, can people get into my, into my source code, but, well, I'm trying to shed light on something, and is this going to get somebody killed? Because what I thought was a secure channel turns out that it's not. So that's a, that's a real big one. And uh, um, just a, a friend of mine who used to be in Spokane and now he's in New York, he, uh, just showing some of this overlap between, he built this little thing called the, uh, the Onion Browser, which is like a Tor wrapper for iOS. But he works for a newspaper, and that's what he did. He was working at the Spokesman Review, and he just knew that this was a problem. And so he built this quick little iOS app and keeps, you know, keeps maintaining it now. Data journalism is journalism. And when I get into this, these conversations, I don't have to convince you quite as much. But when I talk with like journalists and editors, especially like editors and managers, and like, no, this isn't the IT department. This isn't the journalists have an idea for the story. We need some nerds to build something for us. Let's shove a bunch of stuff over the fence, and hopefully it comes back. That's not data journalism. Data journalism is you're still doing reporting, editing, and distributing. But instead of focusing on human subjects, you're focusing on data subjects, which could be a huge range of things. This used to be called computer-assisted reporting. So back in you know, the late 60s, 70s, the kind of this, this, this term came out, computer-assisted reporting, which is still used and kind of weird because isn't all reporting computer-assisted. It'd be pretty tough to do it, like slow reporting. I don't know what you would call it without. But it's lots of spreadsheets, and then derivative works of spreadsheets. Getting this stuff from government, really gross PDFs. Um, the big distinction between a data journalist and maybe an open source developer, maybe, would be the idea of pragmatism and not doing something for beauty's sake. Like a data journalist probably wouldn't spend like a month doing something to fix like the Linux kernel. You know, they. 
th that's just not what they're there for. Or writing, so, like, let's refactor this from 50 lines into 30 lines so that the code is purity or, or poetry. They don't really care. It's like, I want to build the thing so that it functions. I want to get it out in front of as many people as possible. And probably aren't going to come back and refactor it unless you can use a significant amount of that code for something else. The, the couple main professional organizations that, and, and these are both are doing a pretty good job now of trying to bring people in from other, uh, from other fields, bringing in the hardware and software folks and showing that there is this kind of common problems that people are trying to solve. The um, IRE, Investigative Reporters and Editors, and they have the most fun conference, at least for me, is called NICAR, which is just all people that are using things like you know, um, open street maps and D3 and all like the, all those toolkits and showing all these amazing ways they're, they're using it to do storytelling. Also the, the online news association. Th this is an interesting crowd and one that's kind of near and dear to my heart as a, as a former educator, educator at, um, at the University of Florida. The, the online news association is more the people that are storytellers. Like they really want to tell a story. They, they, they might be um, multimedia journalists five years ago might be a name for them. And now there's all of these great digital toolkits to tell stories using data. And well, that's what they're really interested in. How can I, instead of writing paragraphs to tell something, how can I use a chart or a map to emphasize that story point? But IRE, they're focused on the, the big data sets and the big spreadsheets. And ONA is more the storytelling. And how can I use digital tools for storytelling? And there's a lot of tools that, that journalists have built that have kind of come back to the open source community that you might not know about. And really, most journalists, I can't even think of one where they build closed source tools almost to a, almost to a person. If somebody is a journalist that's, that's uh, building uh, with code, almost everything's open source. I, cannot, I, can't, I really can't think of something that's closed. One of the kind of initial bridges between journalism and open source uh, is this guy, uh, Adrian Holovati, who was kind of at the time where Rails was starting to uh, develop, decided to write a Python framework called Django in Lawrence, Kansas, along with a couple other guys. And they had built their own internal CMS, abstracted it to, to Django, and then released it. And that was a pretty bold move at the time, where you have this small, private, uh, for-profit, family-owned newspaper in Kansas. And they're like, oh, well, we shouldn't make this CMS that we're going to sell to a bunch of people, which they still tried to, Ellington. But we should give away the core functionality as Django. We should just open source it because it's better. It'll let us do better journalism. People are going to use this elsewhere, and they're going to fix things, and they're going to submit, you know, submit bug fixes. Um, and now Django is used pretty widespread in, for news development, except for New York is really heavy uh, rails. But most other places seem to be dominated by, by Django. Another one, lots of job, uh, JavaScript stuff. The guy, uh, Jeremy Ashkenaz, probably everybody here, a lot of people here have heard of this guy. He works for the New York Times. Um, was part of a, a Knight Foundation grant. This, this product's called Document Cloud. That we, what it tried to do is make it where you could sh shove in PDFs or just whatever gross documents you wanted to, and it made it where you could comment and annotate in the browser. And the idea was, Reporters find all this stuff. They need to distribute, the, uh, have a means to do distributed annotation, and then be able to display it to their readers. The Guardian did something uh, big similarly eh, three years ago, I guess it was, with the, the MP expenses, where they had these like thousands and thousands of pages of MP expenses. And you, as a reader, could just sign up of like, hey, let me help. And you'd put in your little email address, and they would send you 10 or 11 um, pages of it. And you would go through. And all you had to do was annotate things that were interesting. Just tell me if this is interesting, and, uh, and the, the journalist should look at it more. And then they did uh, some little confirmatory that they make sure a couple people both said the same paragraph was interesting. And then they would turn a journalist loose, loose on it to dig deeper instead of trying to sort through 2,000 pages like, as, as a small team. That would take forever. Uh, but also out of Document Cloud, they created Backbone and Underscore, and he also made uh, CopyScript. Um, been about five or six years now where this kind of this idea of recruiting developers to do journalism had been a thing. Before that, it was just, as uh, w one of my buddies calls it, it was the toxic goo mutant. 
That's this guy, Jeremy Bowers. He was, describes himself as the toxic goo mutant. That he used to work at the St. Petersburg Times, and now he's at NPR. And he actually was the guy that like changed chemicals in the tanks for when they actually would like create plates in the way that they used to manufacture print newspapers. And he would do programming on the side, and so he's like, you know, down like working in this goo, and he found out that somebody was actually like processing uh, spreadsheets to tell the story, and he's like, that's awesome, let me help. And then within like I think a two months or something like that, they 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 sucked him into their team, and he went on to uh, to help with a, a site there called Politifact, that was the first. Pulitzer Prize winning data journalism project. So this, this kind of this, this effort of bringing developers, at, making them journalists, not being the IT department, or not being tech help, not being the people we throw stuff over the fence to, but instead we need technologists on our team. We have to have project managers, we have to have writers, we have to have editors, photographers, all sorts of people, and we have to be on the team to do this. That's, that's kind of this big change that happened in the latter part of the 2000s. Kind of, maybe not the first, but really kind of kicked off in a, in a, in a, in a splash big way by the Knight Foundation funding uh, Northwestern University to give scholarships to computer scientists to go back and get master's degrees in journalism. So, so these two guys were the, the first recipients of Brian Boyer on the right and Ryan Mark who then they started a, a news apps team at the Chicago Tribune and started using a bunch of Django. Their team grew, and, and they do all sorts of crazy stuff there. Their team grew from two to, I think maybe they're 10 now, and, and Brian has since left and just started an apps team a little less than a year ago at NPR, who, if you've seen any of their stuff, it's probably the Arrested Development Inside Joke uh, project. Have anybody seen this one? It's like every single inside reference ever made in any Arrested Development uh, episode. You click it and it like does this map thing and it shows you every time point in every episode. It's pretty intricate. So that was, that was one where they were doing it's more of service, being fun, not shedding light. So they do have fun as well. Um, the Knight Foundation, which is a nonprofit that was based out of the Knight Ritter newspaper chain that used to own the Miami Herald and a bunch of other stuff and has a really interesting digital history with these kind of initial tablet newspaper prototypes in the, in the 80s, or, um, all sorts of different stuff. But Knight Foundation funds a lot of these prototype projects and they have a project with Mozilla where they, they do these fellowships and get programmers to be embedded in, in uh, newsrooms. So some of these people, you'd call them journalists beforehand, a lot of them are just straight programmers and then they embed them in newsrooms so that they can be on a team and hopefully see how kind of the, the shared ethos of open source uh, can be used for journalism and, and try to convert some of them to be, to be full-time journalists. There's also the Associated Press and Google have scholarships for college students. And these, these two both happen to be at Northwestern, which is kind of good and bad. Um, that of like, well, Northwestern is doing a lot of this really interesting stuff, but that's a pretty highbrow place. You know, of how, how many people can you pump through that can do world-changing things when you have to pay the sort of money that you have to pay to go to Northwestern? It's, it's not really an accessible thing uh, to solve like industry-wide problems. Um, some examples, and I, so for slide deck later, I, I've got some of these that I'll show, and then some more for later. You could bug me on, on Twitter if you want some more. Uh, but some real interesting projects of just of how you can take big, big data sets and use them uh, for storytelling. The, the prescribers, I figure probably a lot of people saw this a couple months ago where there was all of this, um, all of these stories based on the differences in um, medical expenses across different cities and states. That some procedures might cost thousand bucks here and thirty thousand dollars here. And the, the, the prescribers specifically was a story that they generated out of all that raw medical data that, oh, there's a Portland guy sending me an email. Why is that, why is that popping up? Um, it, this, the, this specific project was showing how out of all of the prescriptions, let me make sure I don't mess it up. Let me, let me link to it and get the exact number. I know pretty close, but where are you? There we go. 1.1 billion prescriptions, or and one point, almost 2 million people that wrote prescriptions in 2010, and 3% of them wrote half of the prescriptions. Power law. Was that? A power law? Yeah, 
Right. And so it's like, okay, well, that's a pretty clear way to find out these people are abusing prescription writing. There's something, there's something wrong here. Message Machine, this is by ProPublica in New York. And ProPublica does awesome stuff. Um, and they make a bunch of tools as well. The, the Message Machine was, was almost this is, um, reverse email A-B testing. So what they would do is they would ask you, whomever, what are your emails you're getting in the 2012 election, forward your emails to us. So whether it's for a national, state, whatever. They sucked in all of the emails because users would just forward it to them. And they were trying to tease out is what the candidates were trying to find out from their, from their, um, from the, their followers. Why were they changing these messages? Are they, they're trying to see that uh, child care is, is a big issue for them. Or they might be trying to find out the environment. And so there was this kind of reverse A-B testing I thought was pretty fascinating. And something that, that's, this is not something that you would ever do in, in kind of traditional journalism because you just can't. What are you going to do? Read a stack of emails and try to come up with an idea of what they were getting at? Um, this, this represent project, unfortunately it's down right now uh, because they're, they're rewriting their API. But this is in, in New York and this same sort of thing should totally exist in Portland or any city. What it is, it's just an API that the, the New York Times provides where you can type in your address and it sends back all status updates from the people who represent you. City, county, state level. And it says, you know, Bob Jones voted yes on this bill 30 minutes ago. So, you know, Susie Baker did this seven minutes ago. This person was absent from this vote. And it really gives you, as a news consumer, like the granularity that if you want to just know that that person who represents my, you know, my little section of Portland, what are they doing with their time? Programmatic way that you can get it. Um, getting the data for that is a little bit tricky. I mean, that's something where if, if somebody wanted to actually write the code to, for that API, but you needed some help going in, like tracking down all this public record stuff, nothing makes journalists happier than doing Freedom of Information Act requests. <laughs> Even though they, they, they bemoan it, and, oh my gosh, this takes so much time, they love it. I mean, journalists love just like kicking bees' nests. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Yes, Sunlight Foundation does it federal. And, but I, and the represent goes all the way down to, to city level. I was fortunate enough to be able to work on this uh, America's Worst Charities project, which has gotten some, some play uh, recently. And the idea was based off of 10 years of data for all these different charities of what money that they were getting how much was essentially getting sucked away by telephone solicitation and how little made it down to the cause itself. And it's pretty, uh, it's pretty frightening. <laughs> so here's your nice little chart. Out of a bill, almost a billion dollars, only 50 actually, of, from these 50 charities, the worst in America, only about 50 million actually made it down to the cause itself. That's pretty, uh, pretty atrocious. So I spend most of my day is, is I do interface design and some media prototyping stuff. So this was kind of fun to be able to work on because it's like when you get scale and news things get scale that you just cannot get anyplace else. Like Tampa Bay Times is not, an, it, not a huge publication. It's not like the New York Times. This specific little app had uh, over a million visits in less than 24 hours. And so for me, that's pretty awesome. I don't get to touch things that get a million visits over a month, very rarely. And this had a million in 24 hours. So there's always places that if you want to contribute on projects like this, there are people that want you, um, that have crazy amounts of data, and they don't know what to do with it. And if you're just, if you're just feeling like the mission already, you can bug me afterwards, and I will, I will connect you with people. Census Reporter is actually just their beta opened up yesterday. This is an interesting one because census data is huge, huge, huge data sets. And trying to see what's in it and trying to find out the stories of, oh, well, our you know, demographics in our city changed this way. Or median income in our city changed that way. And what does that mean? We see that the you know, demographics change this way and in this area of our city, but why is all of the, the zoning and planning money being spent in this other place? Like, 
Population decrease there, but more, more budget being allocated toward building. Something doesn't seem right. Is there a crooked relationship going on between developers and the people with the money? Uh, so right now it doesn't, it's not huge, if I could type correctly, Portland. So I'll look under Portland City. You can see, of course, beta, just lure Mipsum right now. But it takes what would be this huge spreadsheet and just tries to make it a little bit more accessible and tell you demographics about your city. And they're working on their API so that you could match across. Check this city, that city. Let me see the differences between median age, income, uh, ethnicity, all sorts of things. This isn't fascinating from a computer science standpoint. It's just, just it's grunt work. But this is what the data journalists excel at is I know my friends that, and you know, my colleagues in the newsroom have these reams of data that 10 years ago would have just sat under their desk and there's nothing they would have ever been able to do to it. And I can process this and give them something back they can actually work with every single day. Doing census reporting would take two years of preparation to get everything ready to go and to write your stories. And they're trying to then make it where you know, you, any publication can hit this stuff and, and, get, up and get up and going instantly. But as we're seeing, we're losing a lot of these people to technology companies and t Twitter especially, as Twitter is really, you know, whether they have an editorial team, they don't really have that yet, but it's clear that you know, Twitter is kind of the, the new wire, the new wire service where the stuff moves first. And a lot of the great designers and developers from uh, NPR, New York Times, Denver Post, a bunch of different places are getting hired uh, by Twitter specifically. And so we run into this problem, pretty small community, how do we get more of them? And the journalism schools are just woefully un unequipped for this, and I'm not bashing journalism schools in any sort of way. Um, and I was a, an educator at the University of Florida for five or six years, five, five years, and I left to run my own little design shop, but kind of that mission I have for doing the education part never quite went away. And it's, it's, it's very interesting if you go to a journalism school and you see the curriculum that they're, they're, they're teaching. And it's one of those, like, are they just you know, covering my ears, covering my eyes? I don't want to see what's going on in the world. Like, why am I teaching some of these things that aren't particularly rel relevant? But another fact is there's nobody to teach it. So it's like, all right, well, you should be able to use Excel and you should be able to process this data and work with a CSV and you should be able to put it on a map. There are not people that can teach it. And the few that can aren't, aren't like sunsetting from their careers to go be at academic institutions. And that kind of tenure model is really, is really busted. And so I've been working on this project for a couple years called um, uh, For Journalism. And the idea started with having um, I saw a professional master's program, these professional master's programs that were starting to get created at journalism schools, and they were all geared around essentially using Adobe to do visual storytelling. And it was very, very depressing. And it just seemed like, and there's, I think there's a lot of, you know, kind of push for MOOCs at universities this way of let's put out something and let's just see if we can get massive scale and how much money we can make off this and not actually doing it as something to try to solve an educational need or solve a supply issue in the industry. Because the demand for journalists, or not even journalists, but just straight programmers in, for media companies is insane right now. I mean, there's probably 15 openings at the New York Times right now I think Al Jazeera America has dozens of openings. Uh, and that just never, never in the history of news could you go straight from college, basically intern for six months, and you could be working at the Washington Post or the New York Times. Did not exist. It exists now. Lots of people do this. But it's hard to train. The supply is, is so off. So what I, what I started to do um, is I asked about two years ago, to all the news apps devs I, I knew, if you were starting your ultimate hacker journalism master's program, what would, what would be in it? So you've got eight courses at a master's level. This is some, something that somebody actually would pay real money for. What would be the courses? And we narrowed down all the topics. And then I threw it back to them all with a question of, all right, so all this stuff is important. But now rank it for me of which ones do you think, if you were hiring somebody for your team, which skills do you want them to have? So everybody kind of wants full stack developers. 
rank this? What, what should people have? And then that, that got us down to like 12 to 16 things. And then I put it back to them of, all right, so out of all these, who is qualified, who is the most qualified to, de to teach these courses? Professors not allowed. And not because I'm a professor basher, it's just the, the idea is I want people who are really, really low to the ground on this. The people that are doing it every day and are basically, I cannot find people for my team. I have two openings right now and there is nobody to find for my team. So how do we make people that would be, uh, what, what do you want on your team? Do you have a question? I, I kind of wanted to ask Sure. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about that because you were just talking about curriculum. And I'm not seeing it at like just the undergrad level. Well, here's the pro it's a catch-22 that there's not many undergrad programs that are properly equipping for the job openings that there are. So, right. so, that so that's the catch-22. The master's programs, there's some, like Columbia is trying to do good things, Northwestern is doing good things, but the cost of it is insanity. Um, and I don't fault them because it's just it's what the it's what the economies are for those institutions. So there's nothing wrong with that. But you know, if you kind of have this a bit of a higher calling, and you want to do a job that might be making you, you know, eighty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars a year, and not be like, oh, well, I'm going to some place that might make make me two hundred or two fifty with you know that that kind of thing. Since you're trying to play to people's, I'm not just in it for the money. I want to not be starving, but I have to be able, I want to do something that I feel is meaningful with my life. And it's hard to do that when you're saddled with $300,000 in debt. It's really hard to spend your nights of like, that's, a, that's an injustice. I'm going to hack on something that solved that injustice. Instead, I got to freelance. I got to do whatever I can do because I got to try to pay down this crazy student loan bill that's coming in every month. So yeah, so that's like one of the things that I, I, I see as a problem because, and even if it was cheaper, the scale doesn't, it's a hard scale. How many people can you put through Columbia? 20 a year or so, 25 a year through some of these programs? So this uh, For Journalism project is all based around practical news applications. And at the core, it's, a, it's books. And sc uh, screencasts, code samples, repos, all sorts of stuff that instead of buying a Python book to be like, oh, okay, well, I want to learn how to build a social network, it's going to be, I'm going to learn how to do this journalism thing because journalists, for the most part, don't care about the like the poetry of it. You know, they want to. I want to solve this problem. I don't want to just spend, um, you know, two weeks learning about arrays and typing and all that type of stuff. Teach me about array when I need to know about an array. And as long as I can just type along and do my brackets and it works, then I'm then I'm relatively happy. They 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 can tolerate uh, magic. Our initial batch of of courses is we're trying to go kind of a pretty broad range, full stack, based on what I, what I talked about. And everybody here, they were all kind of essentially nominated by their peers, and they are all kind of best in breed at their, at their different um, institutions, like New York Times, LA Times, um, Night Mozilla, Texas Tribune, LA Times, ProPublica. And I'd be interested in, um, I'd love any sort of feedback or contributions that you all would want to make to this of, because it's very trying to be practical. We're trying to make, we, we used Kickstarter for some initial funding on this so I can pay, essentially pay these people. You know, let me pay you for your time so that you can teach so that I can, you know, I can get you to do this because your, your brains are valuable. You should be getting some compensation for, for doing this because I don't want you to have to be thinking about all these other loans and all these other things that you have to do. But Everything we're doing, we're putting on GitHub, so all the code is open source. Our, our course outlines are open source. We're using our issue trackers for all, like, for all of the outlines. So we're trying to kind of straddle this. I don't, freemium's a bad word for it, but I think a lot of people do this. We're trying to make the core knowledge completely open source and would please give us all feedback that you can, and then um, provide this little bit of a, a, a hosted facilitation where people can have office hours and some stuff like that. And, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. The problem, you know, as you brought up with, with like, well, do you go from graduate school? That's, that's how people are kind of getting hired. And, and a lot of those people, it's not really even, and I'm, this is very biased right here. This is biased. It's not really a function of the program that they're in. It's graduate school, 
in most cases, gives you opportunity to do something that inspires you. And so it's that free form nature to it and having amazing uh, facilities and resources so that like at a Columbia or a Northwestern, but it's not really, I did this class, this class, this class, and now I'm an awesome JavaScript developer or I'm an awesome mapper. Right. Because I want to do good in the world and do this. Like, how are you seeing um, what's being covered based on that? How much is, is it in, in the stuff that's being covered in these um, investigative reports talk about low income? So, like, what the, of what the professional master's programs are trying to teach? Well, I think the uh, no, I um, well, the like the the ProPublica ProPublica stuff. I think is them and the, and the New York Times and Chicago Tribune have done a lot of stuff that almost have more impact on low income than they do on high income, uh, because of seeing things like where flame Chicago Tribune did a really in depth study on flame retardants in pretty much any sort of thing that you touch in your day, and all of those the physiological impacts of being being exposed to flame retardants have. And you see this with artificial chemicals and food, all sorts of things that certainly affect lower income more than the higher income where you can, you can afford to have the things that don't have to have those treatments on them. So I think it actually, like these data projects, skew to helping lower income more than higher income. I think, maybe I'm, maybe I'm biased to that, but would you mostly agree, I think? I, the ones I've yeah. Which is frightening. I, I, there's a place out where I go to take sunset pictures. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there's a huge ammonium nitrate plant out there. I'm a, I'm, yeah. Yeah, or in, in inspections of fertilizer processing out in West, West Texas and yeah. seeing well, the lack of supervision on these fertilizer processing and the, and the risk that the, that the, uh, the workers are put into. Um, so what, what I'm... What I and some other folks like we're kind of trying to do. I think that this is. I think this is a good tactic, and I'd I'd love for any you know any conversation you want to have about it, is we kind of have this multifaceted problem that you've got existing journalists that need retraining, and they need you know these are the people. If you know any of these, or they're friends of a friend, and you want to get them to come to your meetups, they will love your stuff. You know, if you show them how you how you how you use you know Arduinos to solve problems because. Like there's a bunch of people that are doing sensor work in, in journalism now. This is actually, I think, probably going to be a big problem in a couple years that there's this real move right now for people to create data with, with sensors. So temperature sensors, soil sensors to predict when the cicadas are coming out and um, you know, noise and chemical and all that type of stuff. And this is going to be, a, I mean, journalists, I think, are going to make a, lot of prob make a lot of problems for themselves here because it's not like you can just build a $30 instrument and get the sort of um, precision that a $10,000 sensor does. Not every sensor needs to cost $10,000, but there's a reason that high quality uh, you know, measuring devices cost a lot of money. Calibration and, and noise reduction. So th I think that would be an amazing opportunity for open source to work with journalism now, uh, especially if you're any, any hardware folks, or, or software for some of these like toolkits is trying to detect when these, like, these sensors and this hardware stuff is giving bad data. Because journalists are way too quick to throw away error. Like, all right, we'll do a sample size of 50, or 100, whatever it is, and then um, and we'll know, okay, well, the answer is you know, 50 plus or minus 3%. They will forget the plus or minus 3%. And you'll see this every single day in presidential approval ratings. Obama's rating is tanking. He went down two, two percentage points with a plus or minus three margin of error, so he might have actually gone up. You don't know. But they just throw away error. Um, so 
I, I've kind of been trumpeting this to, to the people who are work going on the hardware end, but I, I would love help for that. Um, I think some, some, well, I can kind of skip this. These were just some of the organizations that are kind of helping our little initiative. Digital First Media, which owns, owns a bunch of uh, papers, the Denver Post, and a bunch of what San Jose Mercury News, Montclair State University in New Jersey, um, ONA, and, and NBC News. And so, I mean, really, we're just trying to take, make an, a, an open source curriculum for doing programming for journalism, try to you know, talk with open source developers as much as possible. Because we don't want them writing crappy code. We don't want to write bad code. It might not be poetry, but we want to write the best stuff and using, using the proper libraries. And when there's you know, bleeding edge things that can help solve this specific problem, instead of a journalist or a team of developers creating some new thing, that would be amazing if, oh, this thing does that processing that you need, and you can spend your time banging at the government to try to get those stacks of PDFs you then have to scan in OCR. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's the crux where I just wanted to talk about this overlap. And if you have any other like, like questions or examples or experiences you have, I'd love to spend the last seven minutes. Yeah? Are you actively soliciting open source developers to work on your stuff? Or no, no, not yet. Not yet. I think once we st create kind of the initial um, the content and push that into GitHub, we probably will. A couple of our folks are pretty big um, open source folks already. Um, let me see. Uh, Chris Groskoff specifically. Yeah. Well, he, yeah, he's put, he put a huge, he, he's put more into his repo than yes. about anybody else. Yes, and he, he lives open source. He, he has a, his two big things are this thing called CSV kit that does just tons of different processing and transforms off comma separated values and a, um, and a funded project called Panda or the personal, he's Panda? yeah, he's the primary uh, coder for Panda. Oh. Used to be, right. Yeah, he, he left the Tribune to do Panda, and Brian Boyer, who was kind of the principal investigator at the Tribune, was seeing him, overseeing him, and then when Brian went to NPR, Chris finished Panda and hired Chris to go work for NPR. Um, but, but Panda, it's a really interesting project that um, you feed it, uh, it's set, you set up your own little server that you can do it hosted and they give you like a couple scripts to run it on EC2 or you can run it local. And the idea is you create, you got all this data for different investigations and it gives you a place to store it. It's kind of like your filing cabinet and it tries to do entity reconciliation across those different data sets to find out this John Smith. Oh, well this John Smith that's running for office happened to be arrested for this thing 10 years ago. And it's trying to cross-reference and find out John, Jack, you know, that's actually the real person. And it lets you set up all of these, um, you know, kind of watches so that if p certain people or certain events are triggered, it'll send notifications to the newsroom. So then the journalist can know this is a story. It's kind of like, um, I think, the next evolution of the police scanner to find out when news is happening. Um, Travis Swicegood also does a lot of open open source stuff. He's actually he's pretty darn new to journalism uh, himself. He's at the Texas Tribune. He's uh, written a couple a couple JavaScript books and a Git book, a practical Git, I think, right. was his. Yeah. Uh, Prag uh, for pragmatic programmers, yeah. He wrote he wrote that one. Um, Jackie's from outside journalism. She used to, I think she used to work for, she was a Ruby programmer for Hash Rocket before she went over to the sysadmin side of things. And that's my toxic goo mutant friend who, as I've got conversations with, with mutual friends as well, he's almost like, he's almost like the embodiment of what a data, data journalist tries to do because he could make so much more money doing other things, but it just, like, he goes to bed happy because he tries to solve problems. And that's really like what he wants to do. He wants to not have to think about you know, his, his daughter get going into college, but he, has, you know, he wants to solve problems for people. Um, but we're at, at, at GitHub, forjournalism.com, or I think I, have, I haven't I'll put a GitHub link on here yet. I haven't done the badge. But GitHub, for journalism, you can check out any of the uh, courses that we're doing in the outlines. And once they get specced out anymore, do pull requests, please. 
we have a really, really crappy vagrant box <laughs> that just got, it doesn't do anything, but if you have any suggestions for doing environment provisioning, that would be super helpful because I, this is where every, I mean, you probably all ran into this too when you're first starting up and where you tried to do that thing and you couldn't get the package installed and you went away from it for two months and then came back. That's going to be a huge problem for us. And, we're, and you know, we're trying to make it where it's realistic in realistic environments, we don't want to just like create this completely artificial sort of thing or just say, just throw everything on Heroku. Just, just do Heroku because that's not, the New York Times is not going to be throwing in their election center on Heroku. So that's, that's kind of this balance. We're trying to be very practical yet trying to stop those failure points. So environment provisioning would be really, really helpful. Um, uh, cybersecurity. I, I asked a bunch of my friends who, and just and public, what are you know libraries or modules or things that you don't understand from the documentation? And uh, Mike Tegas, the guy who did the Onion browser, said PGP. And I'm like, okay, well this is. <laughs> it's like, okay, I would think from anybody that I know, he 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 knows the security about the best of anybody that I know, and he doesn't understand PGP because the documentation is bad. He doesn't. There's too much magic going on. So, um, so so stuff like that, helping write documentation. That's yeah. You know, Django has really good documentation. I think because of the the journalism background to it and the very the pragmatic thing. I don't care if it's beautiful. I just want it to work. Um, yeah, and if you, and if you want to bug me, you can get to me on on Twitter at at for journalism, or my personal one is go to plan B. So either way, I'm 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 on there all probably too much, but um, I mean thanks thanks for your time. There's lots of awesome stuff that you guys could be seeing here, and hopefully I at least showed you a little bit about data journalism is not IT. There's people that are actually trying to solve real problems, similar problems to what a lot of open source developers are, and hopefully we can bridge and do things together. So, thank you. August, right? End of yeah, end of August. I know you're going to keep me to it. You're going to be you're going to be harassing me. We're working. We're starting to do the the first recording. We've done test recording and probably start to do the first real recording beginning of next week. So, hope he, I think Ryan Pitts, who's doing responsive design, is going to go first. And that's the one that I'm actually, because I'm trying to be a facilitator, but that one I'm going to be kind of more heavy handed. Even though Ryan knows what he's doing, I, I, my goal with that one is to infect journalism schools. Because if, if a journalism school teaches digital stuff, it's probably like a how to build basic websites class. That's like, you know, customize a WordPress theme or whatever, yeah. right? So, and, and, I, and I taught that type of class for, for several years. So I'm trying to basically build, make a drop in replacement of, hey, you're teaching this, just use this, this book instead. And just learn responsive from the start. Because for news, it's gotta be. And there's really no reason for it not to be. It's text. We can reflow text pretty easily. All right. I guess we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you.